Hi guys, this is Phil from the Retro Games News and I'm going to do a new video series uh, which is inspired by a video I saw from another channel which is, uh, the channel is called The Joy of Sticks um, it's a fantastic channel, it's actually based on uh, ST stuff but um, even if you're not into the uh, Atari ST definitely recommend you check it out um, Mark uh, creates some very uh, very interesting videos there and I'll put a link in the description um, and what he did was he did a, a sort of a run through of a magazine and I wanted to do the same sort of thing um, Commodore was more my more my background really so in my mind for the 8-bit uh, well certainly for the Commodore I think Zap 64 was the best magazine simply because it had a lot of character and it was um, probably the first magazine I can think of where the reviewers became sort of stars in their own right um, the likes of Gary um, Gary Penn, Julian Rignall, um, Gary Lydon etc etc um, and you found that people would even kind of queue up to get their autograph at computer fairs and things like that and I can't think of any other magazines offhand um, where that would typically happen so uh, a couple of friends of mine they used to get Crash which is of course the sort of sister magazine based on the um, on the spectrum um, and I was delighted when I saw one day that they were advertising a new magazine which was solely going to be for the Commodore um, and this is that first edition um, this is probably the only magazine as well where I would literally count the days until the next one would come out and I was always excited to see what was the front cover was going to be um, Oliver Frey's artwork in my mind is just one of the best you know certainly for computer games and for many other things that you're going to find around um, and literally bring these games to life because in reality you know when you look at some of the graphics for some of those early games um, not particularly amazing um, but these uh, these front covers could literally you know they would sort of whet your appetite and make you want to see what the game is all about and what better to start off with elite of course bit of a shoddy copy this I think this has uh, obviously been scanned in uh, my physical copy is better than this one but um, anyway so what we're going to do is going to sort of make a run through the magazine itself um, so we've got an advert here for Mooncrester uh, great little shooter I think I first played that on the Spectrum I don't think, I'm not sure if I've actually played that on the Commodore 64 uh, 6.95 I wish games was still 6.95 even the contents page, um, you had sort of bits of artwork and stuff, which certainly set it aside from any other magazine. Most contents pages would be pretty dull, and it uh, just gave you a good, a good run through of what uh, was coming up in the magazine. Um, probably also one of the first magazines that would really concentrate on games as opposed to hardware and and um, type-ins and things like that. Okay, we've got half of an advert here. It's going to be a bit strange, I'm afraid. The sort of double double pages are going to look a bit odd. But we've got Street Hawk, which is pretty dire. Uh, Daily Thompson, that was a fantastic game. But yeah, not quite sure what happened with uh, Street Hawk. Probably the less said the better. The, the uh, TV program was good, of course. Gribbly's Day Out. Uh, I think that was the first one that um, Andrew Braybrook certainly... Uh, the, the most popular, uh, the first popular one that he brought out for, for Houston, and of course went on to then do things like Iridium and Paradroid. But this is certainly an odd game, and, and again, it just shows the sign of the times where you could come out with the most bizarre games, um, whereas now we'll have to play it a bit safe and just stick with doing sequels or, or genres that they know is going to be a safe bet, whether it's first person shooters or um, hack and slashes or whatever. So um, the first editor was um, Christopher Anderson, um, who the 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 first few editions of Zach was actually based down in Yeovil, which um, I'm a bit annoyed with myself that I didn't make the trip there because it was only about 10, 15 miles from my hometown. Um, but I think it was the first three were based down there, and I think it was largely because of Chris Anderson. And then later on, um, because um, I suppose Roger and Ollie wanted them to relocate everybody up to Ludlow. Um, Chris wasn't willing to make the move, and I think also um, uh, Bob Wade also. Um, and then 
it's a bit of a kick in the teeth but then of course chris went on to um, found um, future publishing which had a massive massive success and is still going to this day although i think he sold it on since um, and if you've heard of ted talks so those ted sort of presentations that you see on the internet um chris anderson now is the the curator so he's actually running ted so he's become an incredibly successful person um, but it's just a shame the guy couldn't stick around for for a bit longer really and he was originally the uh, editor of personal computer games uh, and some of the influence from that magazine can be seen um, in zap as well and then of course we have the legendary reviewers so julian rignall uh, i think he appeared quite a few times in cmvg um, he'd won sort of various competitions for uh, his skills at arcade games i think one of which being um, defender uh, then you've got Gary Penn, and I think both of them, uh, they got, kind of got the gig by uh, entering a competition to be a reviewer and also playing games. And they, So good writers, um, a lot of personality. Uh, I think there was maybe uh, a few clashes of personalities back then as well, but you have to understand that these guys were pretty young at the time. Uh, anybody who's sort of in their late teens um, being forced in a room to write reams and reams of uh, reviews and uh, no doubt pretty alcohol fueled as well at times. Um, it's understandable there's going to be a few uh, fallouts and stuff. Um, Bob Wade, as I mentioned, was also, I think, originally was reviewing at Personal Computer Games, so he came over with, with Chris Anderson. Um, but again, it's a shame that it didn't really get to see too much of his personality before he disappeared. And I think then would have been replaced by Gary Lydon, who's Again, absolutely fantastic, fantastic guy. Just what, just reading the banter between these guys alone was, was worth, um, you know, buying the magazine for. Um, then here they're just explaining, because it's the first magazine, I guess, um, how they rate the games, you know, so hookability, you know, I suppose how quickly it sort of draws you in, uh, how much you're getting for your, for your money, um, how original the game is, etc. Uh, they did change this. I mean, there wasn't actually in these first editions, there wasn't one for the overall score, which is a little bit odd. And I suppose that's why they rectified that a bit later on, because at the end of the day, you just want to know what the general kind of overall score is. Um, then you had the zap wrap. So this was the sort of letters. Um, not sure how they got letters for the very first edition. I think some of these were from maybe from Crash, probably drafting in their... Uh, their Commodore buddies to write in some some letters. Oh, I'm not going to I'm not going to read these out now, of course. Okay, then we've got some general information about about the Commodore. I've got a guy here from marketing for US Gold. Another thing to bear in mind with Zap that set him aside from a lot of other magazines is. You would find some magazines would give some glowing reviews for games that were clearly a load of rubbish. And I think it's it's commonly known that a lot of backhanders went on because kids really listened to, you know, what reviewers said. But I think ultimately they were shooting themselves in the foot because if they were giving good reviews and then you went and bought the game and it was a pile of crap, um, you're not really going to trust their reviews in the future. Uh, with the Zap reviewers, they, I mean, sometimes they were brutally honest uh, and you would have people, you know, getting incredibly irate with them if they were giving, um, you know, low scores. Uh, there was, of course, the instance with Mama Lama. Jeff Minter wasn't very happy with the, the score, but it, it just shows how honest they were because they had a, a sort of a personal relationship with Jeff as well. So that must have been a bit, uh, a bit of an awkward moment. I've uh, got, got a bit here about uh, Tony Crowther. Um, again, absolute legend, um, you know, Monty Mole and uh, many other games, that of course, are going to escape my mind right now. And then you've got Andy Walker here, who was the um, head of uh, Task Set. Uh, again, did some strange games, like I think there was one Seaside Special. So, again, you're not going to see that sort of thing on, on your PlayStation or, or Xbox. Oh, I nearly forgot to mention, of course, at the bottom of the last page. Um, Oh, my thing's going to cut off. Let me just move this a second. 
so we had Rockford so Oliver Frey would sort of fill where you'd have these different gaps on the pages and it would look a bit odd so he would fill them with what he called Ollie bugs um, on the on, on the spectrum magazine crash you'd had these sort of funny furry little creatures uh, whereas here you'd had thing which was uh, sorry Rockford which is from uh, the boulder dash and then I think probably a little bit later on because um, I'm not even sure a thing in the spring was out by the time this first edition was out probably not if they were advertising um, Gribbley's day out maybe you can tell me in the comments at the bottom but uh, later on they also got thing on a spring uh, and then there was some other weird character he had like Ken the fish and um, I think there was some sort of nose on legs if I, if I remember rightly um, but again it's just a bit of fun okay advert for blagger again a great game in fact that might have been um, got a feeling that was Tony Crowther as well um, a little bit of a manic minery type type game um, oh that's right yeah so alligator I think um, Tony Crowther was originally someone who worked there in uh, in this shop and then Tony was writing software to sell in the shop I think or to draw kids into the shop so more of a sort of a marketing tool I think that's how that started I might have completely made that up but I'm um, pretty sure that was uh, the case um, now for anything that got a gold medal award that was I mean they're not handed out that often now of course there is one in the first edition but who could argue that uh, elite I mean when you bear in mind the sort of games that are out at the time in sort of 84 85 suddenly having a game where you can you know fly between thousands of different planets and land in space stations and um, get attacked by aliens this was really you know this is an amazing game at the time now look at the price tag 15 quid for the cassette that is that was expensive but you got quite a package I remember rightly and you got a, a sort of a novel with it as well um, but this deservedly got the gold medal award if it was a, a pretty decent game uh, normally sort of 93 to 96 percent you you'd get what's called a zap sizzler uh, and again these were really um as far as the game industry was concerned at the time um it would make a massive boost in sales if you could get a sizzler and it sort of encouraged um companies to you know bring out good games so that they could get these awards from from zap it did make a huge difference uh, and again this is something that was really quite unique to zap where and crash of course where you'd have the reviewers giving their opinions as opposed to normally they would just get a byline at the bottom and you wouldn't really know who the reviewers were and probably didn't care quite as much then about their about their opinion uh, there's a very young David Braden here um, who also fell out of course with <laughs> seemed to be a lot of falling out back in the 80s maybe it was all the <laughs> all the um, narcotics that were flying around or alcohol or whatever it might be or dodgy perms um, but yeah these guys unfortunately don't see eye to eye anymore but uh, made a pretty penny from this game without a doubt okay let's got a competition here to win a copy of Pathfinder which I think also gets reviewed I had a quick go on that the other day not sure if it's one that really uh, has stood the test of time um, but again you have to bear in mind 1985 um, I suppose yeah I mean the graphics pretty simple but um, I guess back then it's all about the about the gameplay got Julian Rignall here this is kind of pre crazy hairstyle so it started to get more and more you know spiky and uh, as as with Gary Penn more and more hair gel being used and I think they started getting a bit more uh, a bit more rebellious as well as time went on rock and bolt never got to play that one Again, a bit strange that that's 10.99. Most games were sort of 7.99 or 9.99, but 10.99 is a bit of an odd price point. Got another advert here for a game, for Activision Cauldron. Very tough game, um, but great graphics. Um, definitely one worth checking out. I tend to find a lot of people reviewing that on Halloween for obvious reasons. In fact, I think I did. Not very original, but there you go. Uh, we've got a news news section so this would normally be sort of previews and news about information coming up new games um, or maybe software houses that are going down the pan um, 
preview here about the new Everyone's Wallies. So that would have been the uh, the follow up to Pajama Rama. Uh, Mike Berry, I'm sure many of you will know that he sang on the B side of Everyone's a Wally. Um, didn't even realise there was an article about that in here. You have to bear in mind at the time I was probably about I don't know 11 or 12, and I was flipping through these and more kind of looking at the reviews than reading some of these sections. So it's actually quite good fun to go back and uh, and look at this stuff and reread some of these things. Uh, there's the advert for Everyone's Wally. Again, a great piece of artwork. Probably one of the first few games where you could play as different characters that were, and then when you weren't playing that particular character, they, they would just randomly roam about the uh, about the place, and then you could go and switch back to them later on. Uh, that was quite a unique thing. Um, I suppose Aliens, which came a bit later on, is another example where you're switching between different characters within the game. Uh, Brian Bloodaxe again did pretty well back then, but again, one I haven't actually had a had a go at. You'll have to excuse me if I scroll through some of this stuff, by the way, if I went through every single page. Um, I seem to remember Mark saying the same thing. It'll be here forever. Um, yeah, there's that Seaside special. Again, another weird price point, £6.90. Why not <laughs> 95 or 99 bit odd. Um, yeah, so this is a pretty good game as well. BC Quest for tyres. Again, bizarre, bizarre sort of... Oh dear, so... Now, I think they dropped this later on. They had this one called Tacky, and this is where it's, you know, it's really particularly bad. Um, you would not be wanting to get that as a as a badge for your game. Another sort of, probably, uh, another kind of hyper sports stroke track and field type ripoff. Another great thing about the early 80s with computer games is they're just, is uh, intellectual property seemed to be non-existent so as long as you didn't call it exactly the same thing um i mean the amount of donkey kong clones and space invader clones is is crazy um nowadays you cannot get away with that got another sizzler here so that's that bounty bob strikes back i'm guessing was there a first bounty bob i don't know i never heard of the first one so sounds like a sequel but again if you know please let me know in the comments spy hunter fantastic game um, very James Bondish. Um, I think originally this was an arcade game. Um, in fact, here it says the arcade winner, so I'm guessing it was a Sega arcade machine. So it probably meant it was pretty tough in the arcade, but I love the fact that you could then, you know, halfway through you could sort of jump into the river and then you got a sort of a speedboat section, uh, which is very kind of live and let die, isn't it, really? Again, got a good, got a good score there. Aqua Racer, not heard of that, and probably for good reasons. It's probably utterly rubbish. Uh, software star, I'm guessing a game where you can become a. a pr oh, actually, yeah, I remember. Um, I'd read an article in. Um, that would have been in the Retro Gamer <laughs> magazine. Um, so Kevin Toms is normally known for his uh, Football Manager stuff, but I think that was a sort of a game that he did on the side. Uh, not into cricket, so even less into cricket games, but if anybody loves cricket. Uh, this is another spin-off from the sort of Wally. Um, I think the only problem with these particular games was towards the end, they were getting a bit samey because they were ultimately looked the same, but they were just changing the character. And it seemed a bit of a step back from uh, everyone's Wally because in this one you only played one character, so it seemed a bit of an odd one trying to break out of a, a department store. Uh, you've got an uh, advert here for some cheap and cheerful Firebird games. Um, Booty was a good one, of course. Um, pretty good value. I think it would probably have been 2 99 if not even one ninety-nine. Oh, there you go, two fifty. It had to be awkward and be something that was completely different to what I just said. But yeah, Firebird, who also then published uh, Elite. Um, Super Huey. A fairly good uh, helicopter simulator, which is a sort of a Vietnam type type thing. Uh, I think I got to play it on the ST, but never actually played it on the 8-bit. Penetrator, which was a, a sort of a scramble type game. World Series Baseball. 
had a quick play on that recently on the Spectrum. Um, again, unfortunately, didn't really stand the test of time. Probably if you're going to play that, maybe Hardball might be a better one to look at. Uh, pole position. Uh, now, this is great. I remember playing this on the Atari 800. Uh, they don't look too impressed. I don't know. Uh, Bob Wade seems to like it, but Gary doesn't seem to. Uh, maybe it's looking a bit basic. They probably could have done a bit more with it on the Commodore 64, in fairness. Um, Gremlins. So, Gremlins, I thought a little bit odd that they decided to go for an adventure format for Gremlins. Um, I do remember the, the putting the Gremlin into the blender or the microwave and, and doing various things, which was quite good fun. But uh, once the novelty of that wore off, pretty glad I didn't actually buy that. Uh, dare I say I uh, copied it off a mate of mine, as many of us did back then. All illegal stuff, of course, but there you go. Um, Airwolf. Now, I did buy this one, actually. Um, I remember the sort of elite hologram that was on the front of the case. Uh, great TV program. Uh, it was pretty good. Uh, at least this, the uh, the helicopter did look like Airwolf, whereas the Spectrum version it looked like more like a chopper. With that said, um, I still do play... Airwolf on the Specky version to this day, whereas this version I probably haven't played it for a good 20 years. I just found it a bit bizarre that you were flying around these very tight caverns in a helicopter. Although thinking about it, the Spectrum version is the same, but it looks completely different. And I just found it really frustrating how the helicopter would get stuck and sort of bounce off the walls. Um, not a bad game, but uh, a bit odd for my in my opinion. Um, but the principle was the same. You were basically rescuing these sort of scientists from within these caverns. Um, the, the reviewers seem to like it anyway. Some other other games that are probably not worth mentioning. Buck Rogers, again, it looks kind of cool. It looks like some of those arcade games, but um, they give it a tacky, so worth avoiding. I think I did actually have a go on that recently on an emulator, and it was really bad. Uh, got a nice advert with the young Tony Crowther. I saw on Facebook the other day a picture of him with his grandson, which made me feel particularly old to think that now he's a granddad. And uh, maybe it's a lesson to us to, you know, just not let life pass you by because it's amazing how quickly the years can can roll on. But it seems like a very nice guy. Um, I haven't got the chance to meet him, but it would be good. Got a bit of piece of music software here. Of course, the the Sid was was uh, legendary. Um, the one thing that really did set it aside from some of the other machines at the time was its music capabilities. Uh, Mini Office. So for those that do want to do a bit of serious work, my dad actually had this news for doing his accounts. Uh, I think he had a word processor with that um, and a database. Shadowfire was amazing. So this is a very original game. It was all sort of icon driven, um, but it felt more like an adventure game. I suppose strategy, I guess, is the best way of describing it. Um, it had really cool music. Um, and if you like the music, you'd also like um, the music to Nodes of Utah because it's done by the same guy. Uh, was it Fallen? Or was, I'm trying to remember his name now. Um, but I'm sure you guys know. Great game. Give my regards to Broad Street, uh, old Paul McCartney trying to get in on the act. Stick to music, mate, if, you're, if I was you. Uh, there was an adventure section as well. I did kind of like how they um, sort of had a, a different section for this because for those that are not into adventure games, you know, they don't want to be wading through that to get to the other reviews. So, and of course, those of those that people that do like adventure games, then they can just skip straight to that section. Um, and I certainly had a lot of fun back in the day typing different things into these games um, along with writing rude words of course as we all did I remember there was a game called Pub Quest and if you wrote a rude word more than three times it started warning you that it would reset the computer and of course I did it a fourth time and it, the screen sort of flickered and then went back to the original back to the, the Commodore sort of boot up screen which I thought was a bit bizarre. And then I went and pressed the key and then and then it came up and said fooled you. And so it hadn't actually crashed. But um, obviously the programmer having a bit of fun <laughs> knowing that kids of a certain age are going to be typing 
f words into uh, into the <laughs> into the text. Um, Tiernanog, um ported to the 64. Actually, better on the Spectrum, I would say. The sprites seem to suit it better. It's a bit Commodore looked a bit chunky. Um, I know that's probably sacrilege to any Commodore fans, but uh, don't worry, I'm not defecting just yet. Um, a few more adverts here towards the back. Here's the advert for Tiernanog. Actually, it doesn't look that bad. I'll take it back. Uh, Lords of Midnight, again, really a Spectrum classic, ported across. Uh, of course, rest in peace, Mike Singleton. I think he passed away in 2012, only in his 50s, which is a great shame because um, he was uh, he was collaborating with the um, with the iPhone and Android version, which did actually get released. And I think since they've done Doom Darts Revenge, really, really, really worth checking out uh, if you haven't done so already. It's only a couple of couple of quid. Uh, we've got an ad advert here for Shadowfire. Not sure why they did this. It was great artwork for the cover. I don't know why they sort of decided to burn it and then take a photo of it. But I guess it's all about being different. Another great thing with Zap, they had these different challenges. So normally they would have kids that would write in and they'd go up to Ludlow and do these different challenges against the uh, reviewers. But the very first one is worth looking at because it's actually the reviewers against each other. Of course, big surprise, uh, Julian comes out on top. But actually each of them did pretty well. In various games, um, this is probably the start of the uh, the rivalry, and you've got all their scores there, which I probably won't be able to beat any of those even to this day. Uh, what is this? Um, um, okay, let me go back up because it's going to bug me. Otherwise, I'm just sort of flipping past these. Uh, a few arguments. Okay, I think it's just snippets about the different games. Maybe a bit of a, a bit of a stocking filler. Uh, this is another one I was really excited about at the time because, of course, all the specy owners were being treated on a on a regular basis to incredibly high quality games by Ultimate Play the Game. So when I saw that finally Commodore was getting their own treatment. Um, very excited. A pretty good game as well. Uh, I love the artwork to this. Um, but again, they didn't really hold up to the specy games, unfortunately. But they certainly had a certainly two or three good games using the character Arthur Pendragon. I've uh, got some more information here. This is still at a time when you could send off for games as well. And you've got the obligatory tip section. Um, normally, if I got so far with the game and then I just wanted to see the end of it, then it was always good to come here and you could hit the reset button in your in your Commodore and then put in these different pokes to get get lives or infinite energy. Got some more tips here. Uh, I think this going back to Staff of Carnath, I think this is a an award that you could get if you were the first person to to beat the game. That would be worth something these days. Uh, I've got a map here as well. I like how the maps were drawn by Oliver Frey, so you can see his very distinctive artwork. Um, one that's worth looking out for is the Night Law map that he did. And also Tina Nog. Uh, got, got some information about different applications and peripherals like the keyboard overlay, which I did actually have this one here. Um, we had a sort of a Beetle, I think it was a Beatles and a Paul Hardcastle play along. Thing that we had. Uh, Dan Busters, pretty good game. Here's the review for Cauldron. Again, it was so tough, you got nine lives and you really got through those pretty quickly. Um, but that was a great game. Sort of a combination of, of sort of flying around and then when you got inside, it, was a, it turned into a platformer. Uh, Frac, uh, I never played that, um, although with that said, a friend of mine at school, uh, I think on the BBC Micro version, had broken to the program and changed it so that uh, there was this sort of big speech bubble that would uh, come up and say frack um, but he changed it so that it said f-u-c-k which uh, yeah as a 10 year old that was <laughs> that was fantastic uh, in fact i'll probably still laugh at that now even though i'm 42. Um, men never really do grow grow out of that sort of stuff 
Uh, I think we've got some strategy stuff here. Uh, I wasn't really into war games, if I'm honest. But um, oh, now here is the very uh, review I was talking about earlier on, Mama Llama. You can see the old Julian there pulling a pulling a face. Uh, Jeff Minter was not happy about that. Uh, again, because it would it would hugely sort of affect their affect their sales. Uh, most of you will know about the soft aid. So there was a you know to help raising money for these poor starving people in Africa. Um, slightly unfortunate that um, it came to light recently that the money instead went to um, various politicians and and was also used for funding arms and different things. But there we go. That's life. We uh, we got some good games on the cheap out of it. Gotcha. Yeah, the poor McCartney man. He keeps go away. Uh, got a nice uh, section here about Jeff Minter looking very young and probably the tidiest he's ever looked. Even trimmed his beard. Um, I never realised back in the day that uh, this game really was a bit of a rip off of the. Uh, I think it was the Empire Strikes Back, if I'm rightly sort of. So instead of um, the attack walkers, you had camels instead. But again. You know, Jeff will always come along and make better versions of it. Certainly, that can be said for Tempest. Um, you know, he's 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 done pretty well out of the Tempest clones. Until recently, Atari. Um, and again, I think Mark uh, on the joysticks uh, mentioned this as well. Um, got upset with him using Tempest and not paying royalties, which is ridiculous. Um, anyway. A few more uh, reviews at the back here. Uh, with these first few editions of Zap, there's a lot more kind of black and white, I suppose, to keep the cost down. But as it become more and more popular, um, we've got a lot more colour. A great full picture there of uh, of the Airwolf ad. Even to this day, still a good looking uh, helicopter and still being used. Um, we've got mail order here, so you could again send off for games. And I think we're sort of drawing to a close here, getting to the towards the end and I think if I remember rightly this is the back cover this game got advertised a lot and I'm not even sure if this ever surfaced um, there were a few games like the uh, the infamous Scooby-Doo game that was being advertised with these great screenshots and it never made the light of day because they were having real sort of technical problems getting it out anyway uh, that's probably enough rambling for me for now um, I hope you enjoyed that uh, if this is a magazine that you read back in the day or any other magazines that you like reading please give me a shout in the comments I'd like to hear uh, your thoughts um, and I will be back no doubt reviewing another magazine soon so thanks for watching um, take care and speak to you soon goodbye